Yeah. Can you fill this and this and this? Good evening. Good to see you guys all here tonight. We are going to worship our Lord and Savior. I'll open us up in prayer if you'll bow with me. God, we come to you again tonight and just thankful that we have another opportunity to hear your word preached. God, just to worship you. We thank you so much for your blessings, for all of these opportunities that we have, God. We thank you so much for being a God that loves us and a God that saves us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing Shout to the Lord to open us up. You'll sing with me. My Jesus. I don't have my capo on. That's way too low. You guys are going to be mad at me and I'm not going to be able to sing it. My Jesus. none like you all of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mind my comfort my shelter tower of refuge and strength let every Christ is Son, give thanks. 
got something to be thankful for, even if it's going real terrible. You still got your salvation. Can't take that away from you. Because it is well. And like I say, no matter what's going on, it can always be seen as well and joy that we can have. Number 705. It is well. When peace like a river attend my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say. prayer time we'll sing give me Jesus it's all we need all the time is Jesus in the morning when I rise
Jesus And when I am alone When I am alone When I am alone Give me Jesus have any prayer requests tonight? Yep, Sam. Oh, I saw her this morning hobbling. I didn't know what was going on. I was wondering if I forgot about a procedure. She just injured herself? She didn't get hit. <laughs> Walking. Walking's hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Jake got in trouble, and she ended up with an injury. <laughs> we'll pray for Mindy. Got a hobble an ankle. Yep, Linda. For some therapy. So she got a knee replacement. Shirley uh, is getting some physical therapy for her knee. Yep. Doug? He's, yes. I think he's getting some kind of stomach thing done. Craig is supposed to get a surgery. You said the 14th? I didn't know what day it was. Pray for Craig for sure. I didn't know she was sick again. Kathy Lason. Is it a cough congestion thing or something else? Okay. Let's pray it works. Doug? Yeah. I heard you saying something about like almost a head on on a, was it on a highway? On the interstate. Wow. <laughs> was there like a big median and they were all the way up? Wow. Well, thank the Lord. Yeah, I think you weren't nailed. For traveling mercies got you back to us safely. Any other prayer requests? Yeah, he's probably still waiting to go see the dentist. Letting the antibiotics work. Yep, David Clark's tooth certain.
All right, we'll take these prayer requests to God. If you'll bow with me, we'll pray together. God, we just come to you tonight again. Um, we live in, live in a world where we're fallen and where we can get injured and sick. And God, we just want to give all these requests to you, knowing even that someday we won't have these problems anymore. But God, in the meantime, we do offer up Mindy to you, praying that you'll take care of her with her ankle, that things would heal very quickly, God, and just that she's able to get around uh, better, for sure. She's going to probably be going to work anyways. So God, we just pray that you'd take away the pains and get her back to 100% very quickly, and she'd give you the glory for that. We also pray for Shirley tonight. We thank you that her surgery went well, things were successful, and that she's up and around and still kind of hobbling, God. We pray for her physical therapy to have good effect. We just pray that you'd bring back the strength and take away the pain from her knee so she's able to get around easily. Just be with her as she goes through that therapy. We also pray for Craig tonight. Looking forward to a surgery is never uh, real fun. We just pray for calm for him, for comfort. And God, we pray for success in the procedure, that uh, these problems that have been plaguing him for so long, you would just sweep in, use that surgeon, and take care of those problems, God, that things would work out ultimately best and that he wouldn't have the issues anymore. Just pray for safety as well as he goes through that. We also pray for Kathy Lason tonight as she's feeling a little under the weather again. And God, we pray for, again, quick, speedy healing. Just take care of her with whatever medicine or situation that needs to happen there. God, we just pray that she's healthy fast. Just bring her back to us. Um, we also pray for David Clark tonight. And, oh, dental pain just... I've only ever had that once, God, but I pray that you would uh, take away those pains from him, that the medicine would, would uh, work quickly and he's able to get into the dentist fast so that he can have that dental pain taken care of. We pray for, pray for some comfort as he goes through that, God. Just take care of him. Let him know you're close. And God, that he would give you the glory for the healing and hopefully the speedy one. And God, we're also thankful and praise you for the wonderful things that you do for us, for bringing uh, Doug and Jennifer back to us safely. And we thank you for the mercies that they've had on the road and keeping them safe. And God, that it didn't turn out any worse or worse at all that uh, it could have for sure. Just thank you for bringing them back to us safely. And God, again, we offer up our service to you tonight. And as usual, God, and always, we always want your message tonight. We pray that you would use Andy to teach us in your word. God, just bring the message you have for us tonight. We pray that our hearts are open and our ears are open to hear it. Just uh, give us what you have for us tonight. God, that it would, uh, that it would definitely affect us and that we could take it where it's needed. We thank you so much for the blessings you give us. God, for your word and for an opportunity again to get into it and study and hear your word preached. Just thank you for all the blessings that you give us and we thank you especially for Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to our time for communion tonight, if you weren't able to partake, we offer it in the evening as well. If you do still need to take communion, we're going to sing a song, have men come forward, give a meditation and a prayer. After the prayer, you can stand where you're at, and they'll bring it to you. We're going to sing number 600, 462, Come Share the Lord. You'll sing with me. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through His loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. So come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord.
you ever have too much to do? I know we've all been there preparing for a big meal or a wedding, some big event, trying to plan things. For us, it's weed harvest, our worst time. We just can't, can't plan good enough to get through all the problems that we've got to deal with. And we hire extra help, and we're not even picky who we get sometimes. Dad always said there's a, there's just not enough hours in the day when when we get busy like this. So, uh, we have this in common with Jesus. Cause he, when he was born into this world, he knew kind of what it was like to have too much to do. And in Mark uh, one said this evening the sun had set, and they brought to him all that were sick and and all those who were demon possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various disease, cast out many demons, and he did not allow demons to speak because they, they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen long before daylight, he went out and departed in a solitary place, and there he, play, there he prayed. And did you catch that? He had uh, all that going on the night before and then got up way before sunrise. Uh, that uh, sounds like what, a lot like we do when we get busy like that. But he had a short time to get a lot done because this was not his home. Jesus was born a long way from home. That's something else we have in common with Jesus. We sang about this this morning. Some of our songs, Andy's been preaching, this is not our home. And John 14 uh, said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go there to prepare a place for you. That's a, that's a good, good feeling that this is not our home. Now, Jesus trade, many we knew he was a carpenter. This might not have been what we actually think of like a wood carpenter. Uh, a lot of scholars thought Joseph was probably a stonemason and Jesus would have learned that trade. It fit with the culture of the time. And um, uh, We sang the song, The Cornerstone, this morning, and it, it uh, uh, made me think that Jesus is in heaven preparing, setting the cornerstone for our mansion. It's another good thought. Now, these songs we sing help us remember what Jesus did for it. I appreciate Kurt and the, and the worship team and all the musicians. So many times through the week, one of these songs will come to mind and just help you get through a, a tough time and there are, many of these songs are so scriptural based and we've got that to remember and this table set for us by Jesus also helps remember the, the sacrifice that he made for us. Let's pray. Lord God, it's, it is amazing with so many things going on whether you take the time and you desire the time for us to come to you to come to you in prayer, to come to you with our problems, with our praises. Lord, you see us as your children, and you desire that time with us. Lord, even before we were your children, you were seeking after us. Lord, we thank you so very much for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. As we take this cup and this loaf, we do so in remembrance for you. Just in we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Um, I didn't know if I was going to say this or not, but I'm going for it. Famous last words. Uh, did you guys meet our new family that was at church this morning? They, they sat right over in that area, um, wore a blue shirt, 
Ross and Charla. They were able to join us for worship this morning. So <laughs> I know that's what Ross, that's why I brought it up because Ross told me that he was like, I saw all these people and I wanted to be like, hi, I'm Ross. How long have you been here? And then it's like, what if it's been a year? And you know, but Ross, Charlotte, we really appreciate all the service that you guys do. And uh, I'm grateful that you guys are able to join us too. So I mean this all in love and uh, Ross just got to dig it in there for you. So um, we are going to be in Acts chapter 5 tonight as we continue on in Acts. And um, I just want to take a real quick moment as we kind of set the stage for this uh, message. But have you ever sat down and thought about our faith? And I, I don't mean in the concept, context of what we believe, but more in the context of what it has endured. And in the fact that, like, um, Jesus, he promised us while he was walking on this earth that we would face hardships. John 16, I tell you this so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Matthew chapter 5, he says in the Beatitudes, blessed are you when you are persecuted for, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And then he goes on to say, blessed are you when people insult you, revile you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Um, Jesus says, I believe it's in John chapter 14, that because the world hates me, they're going to hate you. And then um, throughout Jesus's ministry, he's kind of sharing this concept of when you come to Jesus, you're going to be an outcast. First John says that you cannot love the world and love Jesus. First Peter this morning told us that to be friends with the world is to be an enemy of God. And then we see the epistles even, even where like First Thessalonians, like Paul is writing to them to say the hardships that you are going through is um, building you up and that uh, a lot of the Thessalonians were worried that like, man, we're going through so much trouble. Did Jesus return and we missed the mark? Like, did we get left behind? That's my common fear is that used to be, not anymore. And there, there's just warnings that like it's going to even get worse. Like Paul writes to Titus and Paul writes to other churches saying in the last days, people are going to have itching ears to hear what they want to hear. And they're going to become lovers of self and they're going to pervert what love is and they're going to deny the Christ. And then you look at history. That's all in the Bible that it talks about that. But then you look at the historical accounts of um, people just trying to get rid of Christians, like you see the emperors that were going on. And for 10 emperors, there was persecution in Israel and in Rome and around the world of just trying to wipe out Christianity as a faith. Over and over, they were trying to silence Christians. They're banning and burning Bibles. They're eliminating or, or trying to eliminate Jesus. And it, it truly appears to be this way that when persecution comes, the church grows exponentially. I mean, the largest revival right now is going on in the Middle East, where it is one of the most hostile places to be a Christian. The other largest, uh, I call it a revival, I've been told that's probably not the right word, but church growth, we'll say that. The other largest church growth was in China, where again, it is illegal to be a believer. And we see that numbers and numbers are coming. And it, it's easy to have a faith in easy times. I mean, you know, when it's like, you know, you're winning the lottery and everything like that. It's like, hey, praise God. He is so good. He provided me with a million dollars. I mean, yes, that is awesome. But then whenever we go through those difficult times, that's where we need that foundation. And, and that's kind of my goal in all of this is to build that foundation, as Jeff talked about as we talked about this morning, that cornerstone that our lives and our faith is built on, regardless of what comes our way, so that we are in those difficult times that Jesus says are going to come, we are rooted in Christ, that we are built on Christ, that our foundation is in him. And, and so we see that in Acts, persecution starts coming, and we see that even at some time, maybe, again, not to the level of here, but there's already becoming more and more hostility 
closer to home towards believers. And so the goal here is to be encouraged by looking at the first century church who was going through this and to see the work that God is doing and did do through it all. And so we're going to see some wise words from a man named, uh, I'm going to pronounce it really bad because that's how I do with words. That was bad grammar, but that is how I speak, whatever. Gamma, see? Gamaliel, I, I can pronounce that one. Gamaliel, I had it in my head. Verbalizing it was not good. Anyways, we're going to pray because we need Jesus right now. So, um, Father God, we just come before you. And I'm so grateful again that we can be together. And God, I'm so grateful just that we live in this country. God, um, it's just a blessing from you. And God, this country has done such great things for the kingdom. And I just pray that um, as you have blessed us and God, we are um, able to worship here in peace. Uh, God, may our faith not be in the circumstances, but may our faith be in you. God, may we just uh, be rooted in you in the good times and in the bad times. Uh, may our lives, every moment, just be built on who you are. So God, we just pray that you speak to us tonight. Let us see just the work that you did a couple thousand years ago, and God, the work that you're still doing today, as you say, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so God, encourage us in this time, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen. And so Acts chapter 5 is kind of this really long chapter that has multiple things going on. But we see when we finished Acts chapter 4 last week that Peter and John, they were arrested for speaking in the name of Jesus. And then they were threatened to say, no longer speak in the name of Jesus. And so they go back and they find the other believers and they have that prayer where they're like, God, give us boldness to proclaim your name. And then God, continue to work out, or to stretch out your mighty hand and perform these mighty signs. And we see at this time, the work of God in the church is contagious. It is spreading. I mean, remember, we started with 120, and then it grew to 3,000, and then we were told it grew to 5,000, and it just continues to grow as the church is being active, as they are gathering together in the temple and then in each other's homes. They're breaking bread. Um, they were attractive. They're drawing all of these people to the way that they are living for Christ. They're inspiring awe in the works that God is doing through them. They all have kind of this common goal of it's about Jesus, about building up his church. It, we're told everybody is selling their possessions and giving to the poor and helping one another out. And that theme continues on. And we see that at the end of Acts chapter 4, where again, people are selling their belongings, they're selling fields, they're selling possessions, and they're giving it to the church because they are sold out for this. And, and this might get twisted by people to say, oh, see, socialism is a thing, but they're doing it out of their heart's desire. They're not being forced to do this. They're saying because of the work that God is doing, because of the work that God did in our lives, and also they're thinking, Jesus said he's coming back. He's coming back. I have no need for any of this stuff. Y'all can take it because Jesus is going to come back and take me home. They are willingly giving it up. And there are some, though, that we see here in the first part of Acts chapter 5 who are wanting to claim to be aligned with that, but they're not really. And we see that about Ananias and Sapphira. It says, A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And so here Ananias is coming in, giving the illusion. 
hey, everybody else, they're selling their fields and giving it to the church. We sold a field. Here is everything we sold it for. And Peter is able to see through that, that Ananias is lying about it. Because Peter's like, you didn't have to do this. It was at your disposal. But the moment you say you're giving it all to the church, but truly holding some of it back, that is where you are sinning against God. And therefore God takes his life. And, and it's kind of separating at this moment, the church from the rest of Israel. It's saying that, you know, the church has this standard, like God is not going to deal with sin in the church. And honestly, the one question that I truly have by the end of reading about Ananias and Sapphira is why am I still alive? You know, like, why did Ananias die and I still live? I mean, because honestly, sin is a part of my life. I struggle with it. I'm not defined by it, but it's like, man, so many times I just thank God for his grace that like, I'm still here. Part of me thinks, well, Ananias, I mean, if he was truly saved, he's with Jesus right now too. So he wins, but it's just like at the same time, I question why God is giving me the grace that he's giving me. But we also see that this sin is reminiscent of Judges chapter seven, where Achan and the Israelites are going to battle and they are told, do not take anything from your enemy. And Achan grabs some clothing, he grabs some livestock, he grabs some silver. And so then they find out and he's told you have sinned against God. And so all Israel takes him out and stones him. And so we see that happening here again in Acts chapter five and then verse seven through 11, same thing, Sapphira comes in and Peter pretty much says, is this everything that you guys sold it for? She says, yes. And he says, the feet that buried your husband are at the door. And she drops down and dies again. And then Luke, he gives us some general accounts here of the power of God working through the church in verse 12 through 15. And we'll pick up in verse 14, where it says more than ever. So they gained 3000 in one day. And right now, Luke is saying, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that e they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And so again, we see the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, where Jesus promised that the Spirit would come, that they would perform signs and wonders, that they would be his witnesses. And we see again, Jesus means what he says when he says the world is going to hate them. Because they're doing all of this. And then verse 17 says, the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and they began to teach. And so again, we see God's promises being fulfilled one after another. God is faithful. He holds his promise because God said the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. That happened. God said, do not be worried whenever they bring you before the synagogues about what you will say for the Holy Spirit will give you utterance of what to say. We see that happening. God says that the world is going to hate you because of the word that is happening. And then we see that they pray for boldness at the end of Acts chapter four. And we see that they received it because here, Peter and John were just arrested in Acts chapter four for proclaiming the name of Jesus. They were told, do not speak that name. And they said in verse 19, whether it is right in God's sight for us to speak in the name of Jesus, that's for you to decide. We cannot help but speak about what we have seen. And so then they're released. And what do they do? They go back and they start speaking the name of Jesus. And then they get arrested and they're thrown in prison and the angel lets them out. And what does the angel say? Go into the temple. 
not, hey, go into the shadows, go into all the quiet places. He's like, remember what you were arrested for? I'm going to let you go so that you can go do the exact same thing. The boldness that they pray for, they're being filled with. And so I just want to pause for a brief moment and just kind of ask this question, because again, these are questions that I have to ask myself all the time. Do we pray for that kind of boldness? Do we wake up in the morning and say, God, give me the boldness that as I encounter people, I boldly proclaim your name? Because as Peter told us this morning, he said that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we are God's own possession. And then at the end of verse 9, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are we asking for the boldness to do that? Because Jesus never said, fear not, because there was nothing to fear. But instead, he said, fear not, because I am with you. Fear not, because I will empower you. I will be the one that speaks through you. Because Acts chapter 4, verse 13 told us these aren't special men. It said they were untrained or uneducated common men. But the thing that set them apart was that they had been with Jesus. He changed their lives and they lived for him and they sought his guidance, and they prayed for boldness to be able to speak it. That's the, the big difference that I see from Peter in the Gospels to Peter in the book of Acts, is that in the Gospels, he was kind of with Jesus, and in the book of Acts, he had the Holy Spirit in him. He had this boldness to proclaim the word of God, even after being thrown in prison, even after being released and said, don't speak about Jesus anymore, and then being thrown in prison again, and then he goes back and starts proclaiming again. In an age where pushback might start happening more and more, are we willing to boldly proclaim the truth of Christ? To go back and preach his word, even when we're told, do not speak about that. Well, you know, that's, that's for you to decide but we can't help but speak about what God has done in our lives. And they, they end up getting arrested again because of it. They go out, they speak in the temple, and all of the, the uh, Sanhedrin is like, wait, where did they go because the prison was empty? And then they're like, wait, we see them in the temple speaking again. In verse 25, someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you, charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us? Here they're told, don't speak in the name of Jesus. And then you can see it because Peter has like multiple times in his um, sermon at Pentecost said, this Jesus whom you killed. And then in his second sermon, he repeated that. He said, this Jesus whom you have killed. And it's like Peter is not backing away from the fight because they're like, we told you not to speak of this. And Peter says, we must obey God rather than men. That's our call, to be obedient to God. Paul, he says in Galatians, I think it's 1 verse 10, am I seeking the praise of men or the praise of God? If I were seeking the praise of men, I would no longer be a servant of God. And so here the apostles are saying, we must obey God rather than men. Then he says, the God of our fathers raised Jesus. And here they're like, you're trying to put his blood on us. And then he says this, whom you killed. And so it's like, you're, you're like blaming us. And Peter's like, yes, that's exactly right. You killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as a leader and save, as not a leader, as the leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those, those who obey him. And so Peter says, this is what we must do. You, you can imprison us. You can beat us. We're going to be obedient. And, and so this enrages the, or the uh, leaders. 
So much so that they're ready to kill the apostles. And this is where we see the words of Gamaliel. Was that close enough? Sure. (laughs) We'll go with it. In verse 35, he speaks up because they're wanting to kill them. And he says, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak the name of Jesus. And so again, hearing what Gamaliel just said of, if this is a man, it's going to disappear. It'll, it'll die out. Look at these other two cases where somebody rose up and had a following. And then when that guy died, everybody was like, yeah, that's not really worth my following anymore. That wasn't everything. And so if this Jesus, if it is some man-made thing, it'll fade away. But if it's not, then we cannot stop it because we would be going against God. And again, we've seen the growth of the church in this. 120 to 3,000 to 5,000 to now Luke just told us it is growing faster than it has ever grown before. It started in Jerusalem Soon we're going to see it expands to Asia Minor. And here we are, other side of the world, to where we are preaching the name of Jesus and believing in the name of Jesus. The more they attempt to silence the gospel, the louder it grows, the stronger it grows. The word of God grows. I mean, it it is always living and active. But through history, we see that the, the, the kingdom movement grows in times of persecution. And in times of ease, it seems like it kind of fizzles out. I mean, just kind of look at our our nation in the past two decades. In 2001, we had 9-11. And that following Sunday, the church was full. And I mean the church around the nation. People were attending because it was like, oh man, what's going on? I need hope. I need faith in something. I need to know that there is somebody in control in the midst of this chaos. And then as we get familiar with that, it kind of phases away. And then again, two years ago, it was that the church started to to grow again after COVID as people are like, what's going on? We, We need to hear hope. We need to see that there's somebody bigger than all of this. And now as we're getting familiar with COVID and seeing that, you know, it's something we're going to have to live with. We can start going back to the lake. We can start doing all of this stuff. We're seeing that it's just kind of fading out. The church grows in times of difficulty. Our faith needs to be not in our circumstances, but in God. Because Gamaliel said it. If Jesus is just some other man, it'll die out. But if he is who they say he is, then it is not going to be able to be quenched. As hard as they try, it's not going to happen. Look at all the other religions that there are. One of the main things that separates Christianity from all the others is the tomb is empty, that Jesus has been raised. Mohammed, Buddha, Joseph Smith, David Koresh, they all are dead. Jesus is alive. He is living and he will always live. And his gospel is alive. It cannot be quenched. It will never be shut down. Paul says in Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then Isaiah says, which Peter quoted in first Peter, the grass will wither 
the flower will fade. And before this, he said, all flesh is like grass. All flesh is like flower. And he says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. It has, it will continue to do so. And so we are called to stand firm in it, to place our hope in Jesus, because he will not let us down. Father God, I thank you just for the preservation of your word. God, just that um, you have worked so much throughout history. You, as we look at history, we see your hand in everything. And God, I, I thank you that your word has spread. And I thank you that we have been able to read it and receive it and place our faith in it. And I just pray that um, our hope be in you and that our lives be rooted in you, regardless of what comes our way, that we see that your word will stand forever and that therefore we place our hope in it no matter what comes our way. God, we love you and we just thank you for everything you've done. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We'll close with number 502. In my heart, there rings a melody. I like the... I like the thought of that, that no matter what, God's word and God's power cannot be stopped. We might as well sing about it. In my heart rings a melody. I have a song that Jesus gave me. Oh, it was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Is a melody of love in my heart. There rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart, there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. It will be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing It will be a song with glorious harmony When the courts of heaven ring In my heart there rings a melody There rings a melody with heaven's harmony In my heart there rings a melody There rings a melody of love Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you again for the opportunity just to be here and to hear from your word. God, we thank you for the message that we've heard, and we pray that you constantly focus us on your word, God. Whatever we're supposed to be saying to the people we come in contact with, God, give us those opportunities and give us the courage to step out. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.